Welcome to Mile High Agile 2015. My name is Somnath Ghosh. I'm the president of Agile Denver, a local user group in uh, Colorado. This is uh, the fifth year that we're trying to do this. And uh, we have expanded from 250 people to 850 people. I just wanted to invite everyone across the US, and maybe even the world, to come to Agile Denver to our conference. We just have some really amazing speakers it's a one-day format, probably the lowest price point in all of the world. You get to meet some really good people, you get to network, um, and also uh, see some really good speakers in action, bringing forth the message of what's exactly happening in the industry right now. Um, primarily, um, how did they resolve problems? What did they see in their Agile transformation? Hi, my name is Bob Hartman. I'm the president and founder of Agile for All, and we're the title sponsor this year for the Mile High Agile Elevating Agility Conference. Uh, we've been to the conference every year since it was started, uh, and this year and last year we were title sponsors. And we do it to give back to the community. We don't do it to make money. We do it because we believe it's the right thing to do for the people that we trust in our area. And we like to, we like to see people succeed. And, and this conference really helps them do that. I go around the world teaching and talking to various user groups and conferences. And I tell people all the time, and I, and I don't sugarcoat it, I say, if you're in the Denver area during Mile High Agile, it is the best one day Agile conference in the world. Mike Cohn started his first Scrum project in 1994. How many of us remember AOL? Anyone? Um, as the internet blossomed, Mike was a technology executive helping companies adapt and grow in this new and connected environment. He was the, a founding member of Agile Alliance and Scrum Alliance to advocate a fresh approach to delivering value to customers, and that has now become commonplace. Through his company, Mountain Goat Software, Mike is one of the Agile community's leading and most sought after speakers and trainers. His books, User Stories Applied, Agile Estimation and Planning, and Succeeding with Agile, line many an Agilist bookshelves, like mine. These works have, an indel have, been, have had an indelible impact on our Agile practices throughout our community. My first experience with Mike was hearing him speak at an Agile Denver monthly meeting many years ago. His approachable style uh, makes the topic of agility very accessible. Agile and Scrum could not ask for a better spokesperson than Mike. His warm manner, candor, and deep experience are a potent combination, as you will soon hear. Please join me in welcoming Mike Cohn to the stage. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. I'm sure you know I'm a big proponent of Agile. As Candy just said, I've written a couple of books on it. Succeeding with Agile? You know I love user stories. I've written a book on that. User stories applied. I love estimating and planning. You probably know I've written a ton on those topics. I've written about these things. I advocate these things because I've seen them work. But I could be wrong. In fact, I hope time has proven me wrong about some of the things I've written about. Agile's about experimenting. It's about having an hypothesis, a best guess about the best way to achieve the best results. But sometimes things don't work out for the best. And when they don't, we need to admit that, admit it, and move on. I want to describe a scenario where a company I was working for set up our environment to be able to learn from that environment even when things didn't go for the best. Back in 2000, I was a vice president of engineering for a company here in Colorado. And things were going very well for this company. I had a very good CEO. Our products were successful. Our projects were finishing on time. And I wanted to take advantage of that situation. I wanted to take advantage of having a good CEO with successful products to get good at something we were not good at. I wanted to get good at estimating. So I put in place a couple of simple rules with my team. I told my teams, we had about 20 or so teams in this company, I told my teams that every team had to estimate differently from every other team. They did not need to estimate dramatically differently, but every team had to estimate differently in some, at least small way, from every other team. At first, 
This led to our teams estimating in dramatically different approaches. We started out with some of our teams estimating in what was known as task decomposition. This is where you take a big thing like what we'd call a user story today and break it down into a big list of tasks. We had teams doing what's called parametric estimating. In parametric estimating, you try to build a model to estimate the effort involved in the work. So you would take something like the lines of code or the function points involved in the work and you would multiply the lines of code times the domain complexity, times the average number of years of programmer experience, and divide that by the architect's birth date. And that would give you an estimate of the completion date. We were also starting to dabble with what today we would call story points and ideal days. Most of our projects were around two to three months. We were agile, so most of our projects around two to three months. One of the approaches that I thought would win during this experiment, the approach I favored, was an approach called experienced senior programmer days. This was the approach I thought would win. And not just because it had the great estimating acronym of ESP days, right? I thought that'd be a great acronym for an estimating approach. The idea behind experienced senior programmer days was that each team member would estimate as though he or she were an experienced senior programmer. And the way this was an attempt to normalize what today we would call ideal days. Experienced senior programmer days were an attempt to get around some of the problems that we see with ideal days an attempt to normalize the problems caused by vast differences in experience, skill, and ability between different developers. And it started out by each team creating a definition for what they called an experienced senior programmer. Then team members would estimate how they thought a particular large thing, let's again call it a user story, how much they thought it would take to do that user story. So team members individually would estimate that work. Then team members would make an adjustment based on how they thought they individually compared to the experienced senior programmer they had defined. This worked extremely well for the very first team that we did this with. Well, it turned out to work extremely well because everybody on that first team was essentially an experienced senior programmer. When we rolled this out to subsequent teams, it turned out to not work very well. It didn't work very well because estimating's hard. Estimating how long it's going to take you to do something is hard. Estimating how long it's gonna take some mythical, archetypal, experienced senior programmer, even harder. This was a bad idea. This is a horrible idea. But when we went into this experiment, I went into it thinking this would work. But fortunately, I told myself, although I thought this would be our winning idea, I told myself I could be wrong about this. And fortunately, when we went into this experiment, everybody else went into it with kind of the same mindset, the same mindset of whatever idea they preferred, maybe they were wrong as well. Well, as we ran projects, and teams finished their first and second projects, teams started to select their subsequent estimating approaches. And by the time we were running our second and third projects in that company, we started to see some of the approaches that we'd started with fall out of favor. As we did this, the second and third projects, we started to see some approaches fall out of favor. For example, parametric estimating quickly fell out of favor. It is hard to build a model of how long it's going to take to do the work. Parametric estimating, tough. It is very hard to go to a team and say how many lines of code are in this project. Right? You might as well just ask how long is it going to take. So that approach very quickly fell out of favor. Task decomposition right? very quickly fell out of favor. Right? It takes a lot of time to, to identify all of the tasks. So teams stopped doing parametric estimating. Teams stopped doing task decomposition. Nothing I had done other than put in a few simple rules saying, 
don't estimate the same way as any other team, we saw teams start to coalesce around ideal days and story points. Right? And then teams started to argue about smaller things. They started to argue about the units to use. And you'll see up there, 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16. Some of the teams argued that we should use those numbers, a simple doubling. Other teams started to argue that we should use the Fibonacci sequence. Some of you know that I tend to use that when we estimate. Right? Other teams started to argue about what, how should we round up or down. Some teams said we should be pessimistic, always round up. And if we have a seven, using the numbers on the screen now, round a seven up to an eight. The same with a five, always round a five up to an eight. Other teams said, that's crazy. Let's be optimistic. Let's round a five down to a four. Let's round a seven down to a four. Other teams said, let's be realistic. A five goes to a four, a seven goes to an eight. Other teams started to experiment with how to run the meetings. And they developed some of the techniques that eventually led to uh, some of the things we do in planning poker today. So we had teams starting to experiment with smaller things. Right? They were experimenting with the numbers we were using. They were experimenting with how to conduct the meeting. Some of the teams began to experiment with who should be in the meetings. They were experimenting with could we have a subset of participants? Could we have perhaps just three people in the meeting instead of the whole team in the meeting? Other teams were experimenting with could we have um, just a checklist of items for the meeting? Could we identify five questions? If we asked these five questions, were we assured of coming up with a good estimate? Based on what I've been writing about for the last 10 years, what I've been training on for the last 10 years, you can probably imagine where we ended up. But where we ended up is not the point of this story. The point of this story is that when we began this experiment on estimating, I had an idea of what would work. But I told myself I could be wrong. And you know what? I was wrong. I was wrong. Right? But you know what I learned from being wrong? I learned enough to write this book. But you know what else? Parts of this book could be wrong. In fact, parts of it are wrong. Pages 238 through 240 are wrong. I wrote those because they're what I believed back then. They're not at all what I believe today. I changed my mind because I continued to learn. And that's the key to success, not just in this story. And who cares about one story? But that's the key to success in Scrum, in Agile, in life itself, being willing to learn. I, everybody on that project knew we were bad at estimating and we wanted to get good at estimating. And along the way towards trying to get good at estimating, we had some fierce debates. But we didn't let those fierce debates get in the way of our learning. When I was first putting this talk together, I remembered those fierce debates and those team members with those fierce debates. And I was a little reluctant to use the term open-minded but I looked up open-minded in the dictionary. And the term open-minded, all it means is willing to consider new ideas. And yeah, everybody on that project, in that company back then, was willing to consider new ideas. Almost everybody. And that's all we needed, was a willingness to say, the courage to say, I could be wrong about something. I think it's vital that we approach something like Scrum, kind of my primary process, with a willingness to say, I could be wrong. I think it's vital that we approach Scrum with an open mind. Go into Agile thinking, I could be right. right? Go into it thinking you could be right. Go into it thinking like I did thinking that experienced senior programmer days is the way to go. But reserve just that little bit of open-mindedness that says, 
I could be wrong. What was the last thing, think about this, what was the last thing that you changed your mind about involving Agile or Scrum? It could be something small, like your decision that one-week sprints are the best. Right? You decided that you like one-week sprints better than four-week sprints. Or it could be something that required a grand leap of faith, like your decision to include product owners in retrospectives. Right? Something a little scarier, perhaps, than changing from four-week from four sprints to one-week sprints. But whatever it was, can you think of something that you once firmly believed that you now no longer believe. Think about a process like Scrum and what Scrum would look like today if early advocates of Scrum had not had the courage to say, here's how we should do it, but hey, I could be wrong about this. Right? If they had not had the courage to admit that there was a possibility about being wrong about the process and then the later change their minds. I asked some friends of mine, some proponents, some early proponents of Scrum, some early advocates, and some prominent Agilists to help me out by sharing with me some things that they have changed their minds about. And I want to share those with us. I'm going to refer to them on paper here. The last thing I want to do is misquote somebody like Ron Jeffries be in trouble if I misquote him. So I am going to refer to my notes for these. Um, so here's some, uh, some things that prominent Agilists shared with me that they have changed their minds about. Ron Jeffries and Chet Hendrickson are well known for having abandoned estimating. It's like a dagger to my heart. They used to advocate estimating product backlogs, backlog items in story points, but they thought, hey, we could be wrong about that. And Ron Jeffries and Chet Hendrickson now coach teams not to estimate at all. Ken Rubin, who's the author of The Essential Scrum Book, was once adamant that the Scrum Master not be part of the team. He now says that Scrum Masters can be development team members. Mitch Lacey, who's the author of The Scrum Field Guide Book, like many people, took the daily scrum as gospel. You gotta do the daily scrum daily. He's now told himself he might be wrong about that and says that some high-performing teams can get by without a daily scrum because they're essentially doing it every minute of every day. No longer advocates the daily scrum for every team. Bob Martin, hopefully everybody knows Bob Martin of the Clean Coder video series, calls himself Uncle Bob. We call him Un Uncle Bob. He's the main advocate out there getting people to take, programmers to take their craft seriously. Uncle Bob told me he was a complete skeptic about test-driven development when he first heard about it. In fact, he was so skeptical, he flew up to Oregon to pair program with Kent Beck. He says that it, pair programming with Kent Beck rocked his world, and he has since changed his mind about test-driven development. In his first book on Scrum, the black one, Ken Schwaber wrote that one of the main duties of the Scrum Master was to make sure there were enough chairs at the Daily Scrum. I'm pretty sure Ken doesn't believe that one anymore. Gene Tabeka, author of Collaboration Explained. I know Gene's here. Gene used to focus on sprint planning and sprint reviews as a team's main inspect and adapt checkpoints. Those are the main places where a team could inspect and adapt. Jean told me that she's learned that for teams she works with, that isn't usually enough, and that teams benefit from a form of mid-range planning or road mapping for them to really create awesome products. Henrik Nyberg, he's the author of those uh, Scrum and XP from the Trenches book, and the great Spotify culture videos. Check those out. He once believed that every team needed a dedicated Scrum master but he told himself, hey, I could be wrong, and now says it's fine for a full-time scrum master to perhaps work with up to three teams. Henrik's one of the most uh, open-minded people you'll ever meet. I asked him to send me a couple things he changed his mind about. He sent me a list of about 50 things. I want to share one more just because he sent me so many. Henrik once also believed that teams should be stable, the same team members on every sprint. That's something I still believe. Same team members from sprint to sprint. 
He's one of the most open-minded people you'll ever meet, and he now says, sometimes it works really well to have dynamic teams where people switch around as needed. He's got me thinking, hey, I could be wrong about that one. Scrum butt is a common joke in our industry. We like to make fun of scrum butt. Right? We do scrum, but we do three-month sprints. We do scrum, but we never have anything done at the end of the sprint. But can't you imagine scrum having gotten started inside of waterfall organizations? Right? It had to have. That was the only thing that existed back then. Right? Scrum had to have gotten started, and when it did, it must have been called waterfall butt. Early scrum teams must have been laughed at by their coworkers as early scrum teams said things like, we do waterfall, but we integrate weekly. We do waterfall, but we test all the time. Right? What's new is often laughed at. And these early scrum teams must have been laughed at as they said these things. A huge challenge is that when a team introduces a new practice into their process, they cannot know if that practice will make them better. So they have to treat the introduction of that practice into their process as an experiment. They bring that new process into their process, that new practice into their process as an experiment. They say, this will make us better, but I could be wrong. So we treat the introduction of each new practice as an experiment, but we say, I could be wrong. Now, admitting I could be wrong and saying after the fact I was wrong are very different. In fact, my wife likes to tease me that I have a hard time, at least at home, admitting I was wrong. My wife and I used to watch this television series back in the 90s called Mad About You. Some of you might remember this TV series. Starred Helen Hunt and Paul Reiser as a 30-something married couple living in New York City. I used to love this TV series. And in one episode, Paul Reiser, the husband, gets the opportunity to invest in a virtual reality company. And as an early stage investor, he goes to the hardware company, the virtual reality company, and checks out their product. And he's checking out their product. He puts on the virtual reality goggles. And he puts on these virtual reality gloves. And in this particular product, you get to invent the virtual reality in which you're going to immerse yourself. And with the reality, virtual reality gloves on, the virtual reality goggles on, he invents a virtual reality in which he immerses himself. And the virtual reality he invents is of himself rubbing sunscreen on a swimsuit model. And after inventing that virtual reality, he is ready to invest. Except it's his wife's turn to try out the product. And you can see him getting visibly nervous about what reality is his wife going to invent. Because his wife is putting on the goggles. His wife is putting on the gloves. And he is getting very nervous if that's what he invented What's his wife going to invent? Well, the reality that his wife invents is of her husband repeatedly, over and over, saying things like, I was wrong. <laughs> the vastness of my wrongness was staggering. My wife has this clip saved on YouTube and shows it to me anytime she says, I'm refusing to admit that I was wrong. Being able to admit we're wrong is important to maintaining an open mind. We have to be able to admit when we're wrong. Now, fortunately, I have a much easier time admitting when I'm wrong about something involving work. And I want to share a time that I was very wrong about something involving Agile. Back in the early days of Scrum, we did not have retrospectives. Right? Back when Agile Denver first began, Scrum did not have retrospectives. And some of you have been around Agile long enough to perhaps remember that. Others of you might be newer to Agile and maybe be a little surprised 
Right, wow, Scrum didn't always have retrospectives. Well, if that's news, you probably think, well, no big deal. They didn't have retrospectives. Somebody thought of it, and you know what? They probably all quickly added retrospectives. Well, most people quickly added retrospectives. I didn't. Right? When I first heard about a retrospective, my attitude was this. I said, why in the world would I wait until the end of the sprint to talk with my team about how to get better? Right? That just is ridiculous. If I see a way for my team to get better, I am going to go talk to my team about it right then. I'm not going to wait until the end of the sprint. Well, here's why I was wrong about that. See, I can admit that. I was wrong. Here's why I was so wrong about that. My theory was this. A programmer, let's make it a programmer, is sitting at his or her desk. The programmer comes up with a way to improve. The programmer should get up out of his or her desk and go share it right then, except what happens is the programmer says, OK, I know how we can get better. I'm going to go tell my team. And the programmer starts to get up, and the programmer says, eh, my head's in the middle of the code. I'll tell them about it tomorrow. And tomorrow comes along, and at the daily stand-up, the programmer says, well, um, I worked on this yesterday, and today I'm going to do this, and today I'm going to do that, and oh yeah, I came up with this, uh, this brilliant idea. It was going to save a decade off the schedule. It was, it was, it was, I can't remember. And right there, we've lost the opportunity to have made that improvement. Right? And what I learned was that we're better off setting aside that designated time at the end of the sprint, because the programmer doesn't get up out of his or her desk and go share that opportunity the minute they think of it. Right? Now, I think even the, the biggest defender of retrospectives is going to say, of course, if you come up with a decade-saving opportunity, jump up out of your desk and go share it with the team. Right? Of course, go do that. But how often do you come up with a decade-saving opportunity? Right? So I learned that we're better off setting aside a designated time at the end of the sprint. I was wrong. Right? I can say that. Being able to admit we're wrong is important to being open-minded. We can be opinionated, but we've got to be open-minded. Frank Zappa, famous agilist and musician, once said that a mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it's not open. Here's my challenge for each of us. Go into each session today with an open mind. Bring your opinions, sure. But go in thinking, hey, I could be wrong about that opinion. You know what would be even better? Is if every speaker, every trainer, every presenter, every agile guru you encounter is also thinking, hey, I could be wrong. Because if that happens, if that happens, we all might be open-minded enough for some learning to occur, right? That would be wonderful. I'd like to have everybody here repeat something with me. I'd like to have us all repeat this with me. I could be wrong. Come on, say that with me. I could be wrong. Thank you. That should feel very liberating. Admitting we don't always have to be right. It doesn't always feel that way. So let's look at a few things that we can do to help make sure our minds remain open to new possibilities. I want to share a couple stories. Back in the 1970s, California had a senator, S.I. Hayakawa. And the senator had a young son and the senator told a story about giving his son a bath one night. And the senator put his son in the bath water, and as soon as his son felt the bath water, his son screamed out, Dad, make it warmer. And this surprised the senator, because the senator thought, if anything, the bath water is too warm. And the senator reached down, and the senator felt the water, and the bath water was indeed too warm. Yet here was his son screaming, Dad, make it warmer. But make it warmer means add hot water. So what's going on here? Question your assumptions. I think I know what make it warmer means, but I could be wrong. 
And Senator Hayakawa did question his assumptions. And he realized that to a young child, there's cold, warm, and hot. And when the young child, when his young son said, Dad, make it warmer, his son meant, make it closer to the state I call warm. And Senator Hayakawa added cold water and made it warmer. Back when my daughters were young, if they had said, Dad, make it warmer, I probably would not have stopped to question my assumptions. I would have cranked up the hot water and scalded my daughters, right? Question our assumptions, right? Questioning our assumptions is important to remaining open-minded. Let me share one more example. Back when I was seven years old, I was on a family road trip up the coast of California. And I was being a particularly obnoxious seven-year-old, pestering my dad with questions, bothering my dad. And my dad took out a piece of paper, and my dad drew two rectangles on top of three rectangles. And my dad offered me $100 when I was seven years old if I could draw one line that went through all line segments in that picture. Now, I've looked it up. $100 is a lot of money to any seven-year-old. But there's been a lot of inflation since I was seven years old, and that would be $650 today. And I wanted that $100. So I tried the entire drive up the coast of California to get one line to go through all line segments in that picture. And every now and then, I thought I had it solved, like in the picture on the screen right now. And I handed a picture like that one to my dad. My dad handed it back and said, you missed one. But I wanted it really badly. So when we got to the campground that night, I tried harder by flashlight. I tried again. And I'd get it, and I'd hand it again to my dad. And he'd say, you went through one twice. For 12 years. <laughs> that is not an exaggeration one bit. For 12 years, anytime I had a spare few minutes, I remember sitting in class, drawing in the margins of paper during class. I remember being at a doctor's office in the waiting room trying this. I might have been in a keynote session at a conference trying this. I guarantee some of you are trying this right now, right? <laughs> anytime I had a spare five minutes, I would try to solve this problem. It was not until sophomore year of college, sitting in a class on graph theory, that I began to question my assumption that there even was a solution. Some of you by now have realized that that picture was a variation on the famous Seven Bridges of Konigsberg problem that Leonhard Euler proved has no solution. But because that problem had been given to me by my loving father, <laughs> I assumed it could be solved. When we fail to question our assumptions, we stubbornly repeat our mistakes over and over again. For 12 years, I failed to question my assumptions. So please, question your assumptions. Because you know what? Your assumptions could be wrong. There are really two things that make our assumptions so dangerous. Confirmation bias and hindsight bias. Confirmation bias is our human nature tendency to look for information that confirms things that we believe are true. Suppose you hate one-week sprints. You are convinced that one-week sprints are horrible. While you're here at this conference, you are going to hear, let's say, 12 stories about the evils of one-week sprints. Oh, you're going to hear just as many stories about the evils of four-week sprints. Right? But because you're on the lookout for it, you're going to be aware, you're going to be more attuned to those stories about one-week sprints. That's confirmation bias. A few years ago, my daughter decided to buy a car. And she decided to buy a Nissan Juke. That was the first year that car was being manufactured. 
But between deciding to buy the car and actually purchasing the car, she started to notice Nissan Jukes everywhere. Right? This is confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is dangerous because it convinces us that things we believe are true whether they are or not. Right? So, Nissan Jukes were not suddenly everywhere. One-week sprints do not necessarily cause more problems. But if you think they do, while you're here today, you're going to be more perceptive of hearing those stories about one-week sprints causing problems. So when you go back to the office next week, you think you've heard more stories about the evils of one-week sprints, and you go back more convinced than ever that one-week sprints really do cause problems. Somewhat related to confirmation bias is hindsight bias. Hindsight bias makes us forget how ignorant we once were. I love being a writer. I love writing books. But one of the problems about being a writer is that once you've written something, your words are out there forever. And you may want to forget you once believed something, or you may honestly forget you ever believed that something. But if you wrote it, someone someday is going to remind you about it. And here's a story about that happening to me involving sprint planning. I'm a big believer that we should leave sprint planning having identified a set of tasks, but we should not assign those tasks to specific individuals. So we leave with a big pool of tasks, but we don't have your name on some, his name on others, her name on others, my name on some. We don't do that, just a big pool of tasks. Well, in 2003, when I wrote User Stories Applied, that's not what I wrote. In User Stories Applied, I actually wrote that we should put his name on some, your name on some, her name on some, my name on some. That's what I wrote in 2003 because that's how I was doing it back then. So a year or two ago, I'm teaching a scrum class and I am teaching the approach of do not put names on things. And I am teaching it as though I have believed it my entire life because that's what I remember. And somebody in class, after we finish that little discussion, says, but Mike, but Mike, what about what you wrote in User Stories Applied? I had completely forgotten about that. Right? This is hindsight bias. Hindsight bias makes us think we've always been as brilliant as we are now. We forget all the learning that we went through to get to where we are. So while you're in sessions today, while you're having the great hallway conversations today or this evening, right? be aware of your biases and be aware that you might only be seeking out information that confirms the things that you already believe. And as you're talking to people who may not be as far along in their agile journey as you may be, remember all the learning that you had to go through to get to being as brilliant as you are today, right? This is a hindsight bias. So in remaining open-minded, we have to question our assumptions. A second thing we need to do is exhibit intellectual humility. Now this is an interesting term. I came across this term recently in an article on hiring practices at Google. The article I read said that Google would like to hire people who exhibit intellectual humility. Well, like, of course, right? Who wouldn't? Right, well, the term caught my attention because back when I was in college, I took a lot of philosophy classes. In fact, I took so many philosophy classes, I could have had a minor in philosophy. Except, at the college I went to, in order to have a minor, you had to pay an extra $36 when you graduated. Right? And all that you got for that $36 was on the bottom of your diploma, they would print minored in, in this case, philosophy. And I did not want to pay $36 to have minor in philosophy printed on my diploma. So I technically don't have a minor in philosophy. So when I came across this term, I had to Google it to see who said it and what did it mean. Right? Maybe if I would paid the $36, I would have remembered it. So I Googled intellectual humility. It comes from John Stuart Mill, who in the 19th century 
said that it is a, a virtue, it's a good thing for someone to be able to imagine one of their fundamental beliefs being false. So to picture one of your fundamental beliefs being false. And intellectual humility has to do with understanding the limits of our own knowledge. So it's really about understanding the boundaries between what we believe and what we know. What we believe and what we know. And so to get away from being a little too philosophical, give an example here. As an example, I believe iterations or sprints are a good thing. That to me is a fundamental belief. I really do think sprints are a good thing. I think that is a, there's something good about a team getting together at the start of a period of time, figuring out what they're going to do, and then at the end of some period of time, I don't care if it's a week or two weeks or a month, but at the end of a period of time, just getting together and saying, how do we do? I don't care really how they structure that stuff, but I think there's some value in getting together at the start of a period and getting together at the end of that period and saying, let's do this, how do we do it that? I think that's a good thing. I don't have any scientific proof of that, so it would be intellectually arrogant of me, the opposite of intellectual humility. It would be intellectually arrogant of me to run around talking about sprints or iterations as though I have proof that they're a good thing. So let's exhibit intellectual humility. Let's remember what do we know versus what do we merely believe, okay? So remember the difference between those two. Here's another example of a time when I failed to exhibit intellectual humility. I was teaching a class a little bit ago in San Diego, and someone in class asked me a question. The exact question doesn't matter. It was just one of those who does such and such in Scrum questions. And I knew the answer. Very clear to me, it was the Scrum Master. And I start to open my mouth to say, well, the Scrum Master does that. And as I start to tell the guy, the Scrum Master does that, Somebody from the other side of the room yells out, the team, the whole team does that. And I realized, wow, that's a better answer than the one I was about to give. My intellectual arrogance, my lack of intellectual humility had me about to answer a question. I don't remember the exact question. Had me about to answer a question I had never been asked before when what I should have done was paused and thought about it. Maybe I should have asked the whole class. Always a great thing to do when you don't know the right answer. All right? Maybe I should have asked. Maybe I should have thought about it. Maybe I would have been able to get it right and said the team. Maybe I still would have got it wrong. But that doesn't matter. But I should have, I should have stopped and thought. Right? Instead, my lack of intellectual humility had me blurting out an answer. All right? Shortly after this story that I'm telling you happened, I read an article in the New York Times about a professor from the University of Chicago who had recently died. And this professor at the University of Chicago had a great attitude that to me totally embodied intellectual humility. This professor said, <clears throat> when you're teaching, always assume there's a silent student in the class who knows more than you do. Right? That totally sums up intellectual humility to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to share one more example of intellectual humility, because here's one we'll always kind of be familiar with. Um, and it has to do with those horrible singers who go on shows like America's Got Talent, right? These horrible singers who can't sing, they must know they can't sing, yet they go on TV and sing. Well, it actually turns out they don't know they can't sing. And this is due to something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect says the less you know about something, the less you think there is to know about that thing. The less you know about it, the less you think there is to know. So the horrible singer on America's Got Talent, she's a little bit better than her neighbors. And her, so, so she thinks she's talented. A little bit better than her neighbors, she thinks she's talented. Her neighbors don't want to tell her the truth, so she goes and auditions, 
all of a sudden she's on national TV. What she might have wanted to do instead is say, I could be wrong about my talent, right? The less we know about something, the less experience we have doing it, the worse we are at gauging the depth of our knowledge. This is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Along with a couple of colleagues, I'm involved in a website called Comparative Agility. And a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. This is the whole example of the Dunning-Kruger effect. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. The point of this comparative agility website is for teams to be able to assess how agile they are. And they do this by having team members read statements and then answer whether those statements are true or false or somewhere in between. An example statement, something like this. Management sets goals but doesn't tell team members how to achieve them. And then team members can answer whether that is false Mostly false, not true or false, mostly true or true. Another example statement, all bugs are fixed during the sprint in which they're found. Now the statements on the comparative agility survey are grouped into seven of what we call dimensions. Teamwork, requirements, planning, technical practices, quality, and so on. The quality dimension is oriented around three main areas. Whether the product owners involved, whether the tests are automated, and whether testers are involved early. <clears throat> I'd like to share with you something that I discovered about the quality dimension that, ha- that I noticed with some, not all, but with some of the companies that I worked with. And this has to do with assessing companies six months into their Agile adoption, fairly early, and then assessing them two years in to their Agile adoption. And here's what I noticed. Six months in and two years in. Now, what we're looking at here is the same company, average for multiple teams in that company. And what we can see here is that six months in, they were doing better than two years in, right? After two years, they were worse than they were after two years. Now, if I took every one of us here from this conference and we went to visit this client, we would all agree, I have no doubt in my mind about this at all, we would all agree that they were better after two years than they were after six months. Absolutely positive, we would all agree. Yet here they are telling us they're worse after two years than they were after six months. So what's going on here? Remember, this is a self-assessment. And it's an example of the Dunning-Kruger effect. We ask the team the questions, right? And it's an example of the Dunning-Kruger. So after six months, we ask the teams, are you testing early? Are you testing often? And they said things like, yeah, we're testing early. We are testing just one sprint after the code's written. Are you testing a lot? Yeah, we're writing two or three, sometimes even four tests. To their agile novice minds, that was a lot. Then when we asked them after two years, were you testing early? Were you testing a lot? They said, yes, we're testing in the same sprint. We're writing hundreds of tests, but we should be writing thousands of tests. They knew better because they knew more, right? They knew how good they were, but they knew how good they should be, right? When you don't know very much, you don't think there's much to do, right? The less you know, the less you think there is to know, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Six months in, this is all they thought they had to go. Two years in, they were this good and knew they had to get this good, right? A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So again, self-assessments. So especially when you're first starting out with something, remind yourself of the need for intellectual humility. Remind yourself of how much you don't know. Then when you're starting to get good, starting to feel like you've got something mastered, remind yourself 
how much you really have to go in mastering that subject. I want to talk about one last thing that can help prevent us from being open-minded, and it has to do with avoiding brand loyalty. All right, if we want to continue to learn and grow, we cannot get too attached to any one brand. A few years ago, I was witness to an online discussion involving Ron Jeffries. And at the time, Ron was considered much more of an extreme programming advocate than a scrum guy. And Ron was in a discussion that very quickly turned into a bit of an online fight between extreme programming and Scrum. And I loved Ron's attitude towards the two brands. Ron said, I'll drop mine if you drop yours. I loved that attitude towards the brands. I consider myself an unbranded Agilist. Sure, I get associated with Scrum because Scrum is where I started, it's what I do. But the two ideas I am most closely associated with, story points and user stories, come from extreme programming. Right, so I'll take a good idea wherever I find it. Right, I consider myself an unbranded Agilist. Like Ron Jeffries, I'll drop mine if you drop yours. In fact, one of the things I'd like to drop is the whole term Agile. I'd like what we do to just go back to being called software development again. Right? Let's eventually get rid of the term Agile. It's one, let's just go back to calling it software development eventually. Okay? So one of the things that I'd encourage everyone to do while we're here is to attend a session that speaks to something that you've completely written off. If you're a Scrum person, go to a Kanban session. If you're a, a Kanban person, go to a Scaled Agile Framework session. Right? If you're a hardcore technical person, Go to a session on, uh, on soft skills, uh, facilitation, uh, coaching, whatever it might be. And while there, do the three things we've talked about. Question our assumptions. Exhibit intellectual humility. Right? Avoid brand loyalties. Now, I want to be clear that I've been talking about being open-minded, but don't, understand, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean we need to question everything. The sun will come up tomorrow. That's a certainty. Right? There's no need to think I could be wrong about that. Similarly, with Scrum, there are certain Scrum rules. And I do want to stick with Scrum just for a moment here. Right? If we want to change the Scrum rules, that's fine, but then we're making a different process. I want to stick with Scrum just for a minute, for a few minutes. Right? And sticking with Scrum, we can take things as rules, such as sprints aren't going to be longer than a month. Be done with something at the end of that time period, right? And meet at the start of that time period to figure out what it is you're going to do. Right? We can change those things, but if we change those, we're making a different process. Within Scrum, those are rules. Now, we want to be careful to avoid turning Scrum or any other process into a list of rules. Right? If we turn a process into a list of rules, we pull all the creativity and the spontaneity out of that process. It's very easy to go too far. Here's an example of going too far. One of the leading books on Scrum actually says that the daily Scrum must be conducted left to right around the room. This is going way too far. A scrum master I coached read this in a book, and he said, if that's in the book, it must be there for a reason. I'm doing it. His team knew that it was ridiculous, and his team refused to do it. So he came in on one day, and he said, the book says left to right. That's what we're doing. His team knew it was ridiculous. They went right to left. The next day, he reinforced the rule. We're going right to left. They moved randomly around the room, right? They did anything they could to just point out how ridiculous that rule was, right? That never should have been documented as a rule, okay? So we don't want crazy rules. We do not want to go too far. You know, I don't even like talking about rules. What I find much more interesting are the practices. 
of Scrum or the practices of Agile. I just want to bring up a couple of practices here to illustrate what I mean by practices. Some of the practices are things that come from extreme programming, technical practices, tester of development, pair programming. Other practices have to do with the product backlog, things like user stories, product backlog refinement, sometimes called grooming. Other practices, having a definition of done, Right? Here's a very minor practice, but I want to mention it. Don't start sprints on Mondays. Right? Not a very important practice. When I first started doing Scrum, our teams started on Mondays. Most teams still do. It's very natural. Sprints start on Mondays. Weeks start on Mondays. Just natural. Right? But here's what my teams learned. Mondays suck. Right? <laughs> Nobody wants to come to work on Monday. If Monday starts out with a couple hour planning meeting, all of a sudden, Monday looks like a really good day to schedule things like dentist appointments, right? Sorry, team, that was the only day my dentist could fit me in, right? And so your team starts doing things like getting root canals on Mondays, right? So don't put sprints on Mondays. Don't you know, start them on Wednesday or Thursday, right? Plus, we got all those Monday holidays. All of our presidents are born on Mondays. Right? I'm not saying this is an important, important practice. Just a kind of a minor optimization some teams may find helpful. Right? Um, another practice, sprint zero. Some people may not even be happy I have that listed up there. You may think that's a bad practice. No argument for me. We can talk about that later, whether it's good or bad. But you know what? If we're going to make a list of common practices, Sprint zero deserves to be up there. It's a common practice. Good or bad, it's common. Same with task boards. Now, it's clear that some practices up there are more important than others. Right? Pair programming, test driven, definition of done, definitely more important than little optimizations like don't start on Mondays. So some of these practices much more important than others. Now, suppose you're walking around through the hallways later today and you meet someone who says, I am the world's greatest scrum master. Now, first off, the world's greatest scrum master is probably not the type of person who would ever say that, right? <clears throat> probably doesn't have that big of an ego to say they're the world's greatest scrum master. If I met the world's greatest scrum master, I would want to sit down with the world's greatest scrum master. There's a lot I could learn from talking to the world's greatest scrum master. And so the world's greatest scrum master and I sit down and we have a conversation. And I would want to ask the world's greatest scrum master questions like, uh, what do you think about pair programming? And maybe the world's greatest scrum master loves it or hates it, and I feel the opposite, right? He or she loves it, I hate it. And we have a conversation, a debate about pair programming or test-driven development, whatever. We talk about some of those practices and we have a debate. While we're having that debate, I'd want that world's greatest scrum master to be thinking, I could be wrong, right? I'd want that world's greatest scrum master to be thinking, I could be wrong about that. It's fine for them to have a great opinion. I love it, I hate it, but while we're having that debate, we should each be thinking, I could be wrong about that. I could be wrong about that, right? Because this to me is where scrum gets interesting, where Agile gets interesting. I don't care about the rules. There's not many of those. And whatever we decide they are, we can live with those. But where Agile gets interesting, where Scrum gets interesting, is with the practices. And not the individual practices. We've had those debates. Where I think it gets interesting is with the collection of practices. Which practices together are best for scaling? Which practices are best when we're working with distributed teams? Which practices work best for startups? Which practices work best for web development? Which practices work best together for continuous delivery? Right? That's to me where things get interesting, and that's where I think the debates today, I don't mean just physically today, but in today's agile world, that's where I think we need to be having debates. That's where we need to be figuring out what, what works best for our Scrum teams, our Agile teams. That's the debate we need to be having among Agile people. 
And we need to be having those debates while thinking, here's my opinion, but hey, I could be wrong. I'm open-minded. Now, I haven't had a chance to watch the recent Cosmos TV series. I want to watch that one. But I did watch the one many years ago from 1980. It starred Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan commented on the importance of scientists remaining open-minded. And Sagan said, in science, it often happens that scientists say, you know, that's a really good argument. My position is mistaken. And then they actually change their minds. And you never hear that old view from them again. They really do it. It doesn't happen as often as it should because scientists are human and change is sometimes painful. But it happens every day. I cannot recall the last time something like that happened in politics or religion. I don't want to talk about politics or religion, but I would like to add Agile to Sagan's list. There are too many of us who are no longer as open-minded as we should be about various aspects of Agile or Scrum. When confronted with a great view that's different from our own, we don't say, that's a good argument, my position is mistaken, as Sagan says a good scientist should do. At least we don't do it as often as we should. You're investing a lot of time to be here at this conference, and you or your company are paying for you to be here. It would be a shame if you were to return to your office having not changed your mind about anything. To do that would mean you have not learned or grown while here. My hope for each of us is for us to find something about which we can say, you know, that's a really good argument. My position is mistaken. Without this willingness to look for new practices to adopt, we're no longer improving. So, let's remain open-minded. Let's question our assumptions. Something you're doing is working for you. But is it working because of something unique to your situation, or your domain, or your team, or your environment? When someone here tells you about an alternative approach that's also working, be open to it. Remind yourself that whatever it is that's working for you may be working because of something unique to your situation. Let's exhibit intellectual humility. Let's not be the singers on America's Got Talent who don't have talent. Let's tell ourselves that a true expert at Agile realizes he or she can probably never really be an expert at Agile because people are involved and we're hard to predict. Let's avoid brand loyalty. Sure, for the most part, Scrum pays my bills, but the two ideas I'm most closely associated with came from a different process altogether. Let's take our good ideas wherever we find them and in whatever process we find them. Let go of knowing. Be open to experimentation. Be willing to say, as Carl Sagan said we should, that's a good argument. My position is mistaken. If you loosen your grip on certainty just a little bit, I think you'll find a whole world of possibilities, a new path to learning and growth. But that's just my opinion. And hey, I could be wrong. Thank you. <laughs>